Felix and Tony. Welcome back to another episode of On the Trail with Felix and Tony. I'm Felix Camacho, former governor of Guam and candidate for the upcoming 2022 gubernatorial election. And joining me every week and on every moment on the trail of the 2022 campaign is my running mate, Senator Tony Adda. Off a day. Off a day. On the trail, you will get an insight into our platform, our thoughts on the issues that our island faces, and everything upcoming on the trail to the 2022 primary and general elections. And uh, for this week, I'd like to turn it over to Senator Tony Adda, and uh, let's talk a bit about um, what happened on the trail this week and a recap of the week from Saturday to, to Friday. Oh, absolutely, Felix. You know, before we begin, though, I, I, I noticed a new change in our, in our podcast uh-huh. here, and our producer put a timer now for us, I guess. <laughs> I guess he figured it out. We we just go on too much, don't we? <laughs> so. This is a bit of a, this is what you call the time cop. Yeah, so, you know, I'm, I'm looking at it and it's going 33, 49, 48. So it's like, you know what, hurry up and just get the, the segment with, right? So, But, you know, this, this week, just a recap of what we had this week. Uh, we started out Sunday with our Southern District meeting down at the Netadogs residence. I think it was an awesome turnout for our meeting. We had the, the momentum, the, the enthusiasm of the people there. It was, it was great. I think it's it, wonderful how the trucks came out with all the signs, and we all gathered together in Aganya and, and uh, paraded on down there with a nice caravan. You and I were able to get ahead of the group, um, stand on the side of the road with our wives and our other supporters, and just wave to everyone that was coming, coming through and others coming from the other direction. But... Um, I think that's part of the, the, the trail of the, the campaign, the, the fun of it all, is, is just um, the involvement. is something unique to the islands, unlike what you would maybe experience in the U.S. mainland, but the island has its own flavor. Yeah. And um, the enthusiasm, the fun, and just the, the f- familial type of uh, feeling there. And, of course, the southern hospitality exactly, yeah. that was brought down there. It and I think wonderful. What, what really made it come back was that, you know, the last campaign, the 2020 elections, you know, none of this could have been done. Yeah. But now coming back up, people were so excited. You know, we had it, the, the music playing, the just the excitement of not just the, the people that were there, but also the candidates, you know, our, the candidate for Congress, our, all our uh, senatorial candidates, you and I yeah. and our families. It was just such an awesome time, you know, that uh, we started the week with. And yes. it, it just happened to start in the Southern. Yeah, there's something uh, really about about our southern district on the island. Um, you know, the different families that are there, um, the hospitality, the friendliness. Even I, I think Senator, you and have you and I have experienced even waving. Uh-huh. Uh, there's just a, a, a genuine um, acceptance, or even if they're not for us. Or not, uh, maybe supporting uh, the other the other teams. There's always a a, a sense of um, respect, yeah. You know, and um, and a friendly smile, and a wave, and a nod, a honk. But uh, it, I just feel really, really comfortable down there, and it reminds me a lot about uh, my mom uh, and her mother, of course, coming from Inarahan. Yeah. Uh, and uh, just the culture and and the practices and the norms of of the southern hospitality and the and the the familial gathering you know is what we all experienced down there yeah and uh, for all of us to be there was was terrific i mean even just the setup with the the, the sounds with the the food you know oh, everything it was just all delicious everything <laughs> was really great but you know we really had a good time and uh you know again we thank the the Netado family for hosting at their home and the the southern district uh yeah. Uh, villages for for having it and putting it together for us and uh, having that successful meeting yeah it's amazing uh the generosity of of uh of of people as you know we're we're a team of volunteers right now we're, we're not an incumbent uh a team or administration mm-hmm. so as we're organized it's uh people are giving out of their own pockets and their own free will and, and they're there as volunteers and so 
uh, very exciting, very exciting. Yeah. And um, it was a good start. Absolutely. Start it was heading into start. the primary. Yeah. And then we had coming up uh, the Chiguian Memorial yes. that uh, was also up in Jigo. Mm -hmm. And that closed out our, our liberation festivities, right? It uh, yeah. started up, I believe, with uh, Menengan and then ended with Chiguian. Yeah. And uh, it was great to see, uh, you know, the, the families that were that were there, the war survivors, the yeah. um, just the different folks that uh, lost loved ones uh, throughout the, the war and uh, seeing them and being part of them and being a part of the the uh, the memorial services was uh, a blessing. You know, it's something that uh, I believe our children and future generations should c continue to participate in. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's some, um, I don't, I remember I excused myself and I said, Senator, uh, I'm going to step out to the back. Mm -hmm. Because when I turned around, I saw the mayor of Agania, John Cruz, there, and uh, with a certain gentleman who they identified as being the landowner. So I figured, oh, let me go. Besides, they were, I think they were in the best spot because they were under these large trees that were planted there in the 1970s uh -huh. by the conservation group out of agriculture. And it, it, I believe it was Ted Conception. And I asked him, please explain to me uh, this site and, and, and how uh, they gave you honors, you know, and credit for providing this land for the memorial. And I believe um, the veteran John Blas was up there explaining right. the history and the research done to identify exactly this was the spot where um, these our, our, our men uh, were beheaded, you know, right. our fellow Chamorros. And he, and he said, you know, I... I um, I applied for this land and was granted 20 acres, but because this is the specific site upon which they were, they were uh, beheaded and, and killed, I dedicated this for the memorial. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought it was a very uh, touching tribute that even though it was given, he honored those that passed away by saying, you know, this site is set aside and uh, please use it. Uh, I'd never been to that location before and, and was quite touched by the the story of, of what had happened. Uh, Senator Frank Blas went on to explain another story of, of uh, finding that his father-in-law well, was actually um, was one of the victims there. Yeah. You know, and uh, so the personal stories that that come across and the testimonies that you hear from from people that are really intimate with this with um, the events that occurred, it brings up uh, a lot of memories, but quite amazing. To, to understand the ordeal of, of, of this generation that we call the greatest generation and all they had to endure. Mm -hmm. Quite amazing. Yeah. But thank you on and that. And then during the, just before we close the ceremony there, mm -hmm. you recall Mr. Blas came up, John yes. Blas came up and he mentioned about an ad additional, I think seven, seven men that were, that a location of seven men were on, I think Ramirez Street, I believe he said it was. Wow. that. They said the uh, the military had turned over some uh, documents for that, so I guess yeah. more research will be done into that and mm. the names, and hopefully we'll be able to also get that for next year's uh, you know memorial uh, recognition as well. You know, one final thing on this that that I've I've observed is uh, the Amanamkut that are there, the war survivors. There, the numbers are are really decreasing. Mm -hmm. They're, fewer and fewer of that generation that remain with us and so everything we can do to glean from them as, as like Senator Frank Blas has done the war survivors to get their testimony to get their story so that it's never forgotten I think right. is very important so but just observing the the, the, the individuals that were there at, f as you mentioned you know, started from the start of, of this whole liberation thing and all the different ceremonies and different events uh, that they're still coming out. It's um, but it really is heartwarming to yeah, see that. Yes, it definitely is. Yeah. yeah. So, did you want to just mention anything about um, the Lions induction? I know that uh, you were part of that. Well, you know, I'm I'm a proud lion <laughs> from Guam Harmony Lions Club. All right. <laughs> roar. So anyway, we had our. Oh, come on, you yeah. can give a better roar than roar. That. There you go. <laughs> 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 so we we had Guam Harmony Lions Club induction um, th this past weekend, and it, it was great. Uh, you know, former Senator Luis Munoz is now our what we call our Lion Prexy. Is our, she's the president now of our club, and uh, I'm the second vice president. And nice. you know, we we have uh, we have a great great 
team uh, in, in Guam Harmony Lions Club. I mean, just the members there, they're, they're so amazing. You know, it's just something that, you know, you always try to, you always try to make the time to, to go to your Lions meeting so that, you know, you'll be able to just be able to participate in the different activities. And uh, we're, we're looking forward for a new year and uh, see how this new Lions year goes on. But yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I appreciate that. Yes. And Hopefully we'll get you into a Lions vest. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I know, I know. Uh, there's been a Joanna's. My wife is. A, they've asked her to consider it. So, I'll, the lioness will pre- represent <laughs> us quite well. <laughs> now, I know that uh, you've been quite busy with budget budget sessions, and could you expound on that just a bit? Yeah. So we started the budget uh, the budget process uh, hearings uh, this past week. Um, currently, we're still trying to adopt the revenues for. Uh, this coming uh, fiscal year 23, we're, we're looking at, gosh, it, it's already looking at $1.2 billion uh, for the the FY23 budget. I mean, imagine $1.2 billion. I think that's what, $900 million more than you had in, when you were governor? Yes, that's uh, <laughs> 20 years ago. That's quite, quite uh, a jump in, in the budget expenditure for the government of Guam. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, look at, it, it's just truly amazing how yeah. you know the cost of of uh, operations has increased and yeah. you know what do we have things changed have things not changed i mean you know those are the things that we need to look at and how yeah. we see that you know are, are people getting the value for service that government the cost of government is uh, is at now you know and that leads to a very interesting uh, topic also that um, you were able to go to the Opening of the I Learn Academy, uh, which the is charter a charter school, mm-hmm. which uh, w- was pretty much um, financed and built privately, um, and you want to talk about efficiencies, uh, design, uh, the amount of time it took to build it. Senator, could you share with the with our people? Yeah. So you know, I, I, when when I went there for the uh, the ribbon cutting, it was it was great to see that a new school is opening. You know, um, be it a charter school, but it's still a new school. I mean, I think uh, well, they were they were previously in another facility that was being leased up, but this now was purpose built, purpose built right. for education. This is yeah. a school, state of the art, state of the art classrooms. They have a nice, uh, you know, cafeteria, everything. So everything is just, you know, it's nice to see that when the students go to learn Mm -hmm. that that's what they'll be able to do is learn in this facility because they don't have to worry about a roof leaking or, you know, what, what's going to go on, whether it's going to flood or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So it it was great to see that, um, the, the principal and and the, the faculty and staff, they, they, they were so proud of their, their opening. And I think that's what, you know, Charter schools are great, but we need to bring that balance of mm-hmm. our our Guam Department of Education facilities as well. Right. You know. Well, you know that's interesting. Um, they opened up I I Learn Academy. Uh, I understand that there's a waiting list mm-hmm. where um, many parents want to enroll their children, and it leads us into the hot topic of on the trail, which is education. And uh, so I'd I'd, I'd like to um, talk about that because when we when we we talk. Uh, about I learn and a new facility built very quickly. I understand uh, 18 months. 18 months um, arrangement was federally financed, uh, perhaps through Gita or mm-hmm. Gura. Right. Um, and it reminds me of the schools that we built in my time, um, you know, through municipal lease. That was five schools you built? Privately financed, privately um, maintained and handed over to the, to the government for a 20-year lease, which would soon be expiring, mm-hmm. uh, that, that actual uh, lease program. And the facilities now go back to the government of Guam, and uh, who is now responsible for the maintenance of it and the upkeep. But um, when you think about the difficulty that the government has had in, in the building of Simon Sanchez High School, there's quite a contrast in the in the process of it, the procurement, the the all the requirements that are necessary when you when you go through the the difficult regulatory requirements of government of Guam in trying to undertake a massive project such as building a school as compared to working with the private sector uh-huh. 
and the efficiencies that they bring, um, I, I think there's a, a stark contrast between the two. And would you like to share us on, on that, yeah. Senator? Yeah, absolutely, sir. I, you know, the I, I think when we look at the facilities, right, and granted, yeah, it's an elementary school, right, uh, or I learned it's not really elementary, it's an all-grade school, but, mm -hmm. you know, the if they can build a school in 18 months, mm -hmm. it shouldn't take Gov Guam five years to build a school. When we look at what's going on right now with Simon Sanchez, they're still trying to figure out how they're going to, get get everything into into place and start getting the groundbreaking mm -hmm. but yet we have gw who has a gymnasium that's crumbling yeah. and now the teachers are teaching outside the pe teachers are teach, teaching outside under canopies yeah and what a way to open up a school year you know the gdoe schools just opened up this past week and uh, i understood that uh a lot of students went back to schools with the grass not being cut. Uh, a lot of schools had air conditionings that were not working. Mm -hmm. um, so what what are we doing to ensure that our students get a quality education? I mean, grand, they haven't had that quality education for the past two years. This is not the way we need to start this out. Yeah, You know, we need to ensure that our children get that 21st century uh, quality education. And the first thing we need to do is give them a facility mm -hmm. that they can have learning, uh, a, a good learning environment yeah. with their teachers, because I understand there's still a shortage of teachers as well. Yes, I, I, I know an article came out um, in the papers, and you know they, they focused on the fact that this is the first time since the 2019-2020 um, COVID pandemic you know, arrived on Guam. And so it's the first time since then that they're, the students within the GDOE are back in a face-to-face, -face, you know, uh, environment back at school. And uh, they mentioned about there are nearly 100 uh, teacher, unfilled teaching positions mm -hmm. that remain. Uh, we've talked, of course, to some uh, teachers about what's going on, and I know the administration is or at least uh, GDOE is um, implementing a program called Operation Guardian to address the teacher shortages by taking central staff to fill some of the staffing shortages within the schools, but that's only a temporary band-aid. And so um, there are many different barriers that they're, they're faced with, that they're trying to overcome many challenges that they're, they're look, looking at, and they're working hard to to get to the point where they can control, you know, whatever's going on. But from my perspective, having been governor, uh, it was interesting because when I came in back in 03, um, we now had an elected school board mm -hmm. who then um, chose their superintendent. Uh, they handled their own procurement. And and so the largest government agency that, that uh, requires and demands the greatest amount of financial resources and support is no longer under the direct control or at least influence uh, of the governor. They wanted to um, depoliticize it, I guess. That's what the lawmakers wanted at that point in time. But uh, now you have an elected board. So uh, a lot of times that when, when difficulties came up and problems and challenges, the fingers were always pointed to the administration saying the governor's not providing enough support we're not getting the money out of uh, Department of Administration. We're not getting our allotments, and um, there there were so many issues. So it is a continuous uh, challenge and problem that has been around. When you talk about GW, I remember playing uh, against the GW Warriors and the GW Geckos mm -hmm. back in the mid '70s when I was in, in high school, and GW was the that was the gym you wanted to be at. And eventually, of course, uh, UOG Fieldhouse came into, into play, and that's the crown jewel. But we certainly do need to, to, to work alongside with. And we'll be right back. Across all walks of life, all professions, every societal change, education has been the way forward. As Governor Felix Camacho built five new schools, and he and Tony Atta have solid records on promoting quality education. Vote for the team that has actually accomplished something for education on Guam. That team is Felix Camacho and Tony Atta for Governor and Lieutenant Governor. 
For more on the Camacho Adap plans for education, visit CamachoAdapForGuam.com. I'm Felix Camacho, and I approve this message. Quality health care on Guam requires investments across the entire spectrum of health care services. The Camacho Ada gubernatorial team believes that creating a healthier community requires a holistic approach to health care. This involves preventive medicine, a sustainable public hospital, and a clean environment. Felix and Tony will take a practical approach to modernizing our aging health care infrastructure that accounts for the needs of our residents and the needs of our health care professionals. I'm Felix Camacho, and I approve this message. And now, back on the trail with Felix and Tony. Uh, GDOE and the superintendent and the system. And perhaps there there has to be another look at the system uh-huh. and the way uh, everything has been structured. And could there be a better way of, of doing this? Uh, and and when you, we talked about this, right? Definitely. Uh, with with uh, members in the community, uh, teachers specifically who said, look at, this is what we're, we're faced with. They said, um, the student population size has been reduced. I think one of them was from Astumbo and said, we used to have between 500 and 600 students. Now we're down to 300 students at, at the school. Um, we're, we're experiencing lower class sizes. And she said, that's good for the student-teacher ratio and the attention we can spend on, on each student. But there is a growing trend of a reduced uh, population. We're dealing with teacher shortages right now. We're dealing with supply shortages. We're dealing with a lack of um, textbooks. And um, and then we're facing competition. And it was very interesting because the discussion was about iLearn, right? And right. they said, well, we know we feel that the charter schools are drawing from the resources and the budget that we need for our schools. But at the same time, we recognize that they are all part of the government-sponsored, government of Guam-funded education. Mm-hmm. And then you look at the Department of Defense, the Dodea schools that have been drawing our, from our teacher corps because they have better resources, they have better facilities, they have better benefits, and uh, uh, the support system is tremendous. When you've got the Department of Defense budget behind you, right? How do you compete against that? And so there's a lot of leakage uh, of teachers there. They talked about the evangelical Christian schools, um, Harvest being an example of just thriving and, and doing quite well um, on their own. They talked about the challenges now of the Catholic school systems under the archdiocese and the recent uh, news of San, v- San Vicente School closing uh-huh. down. Um, you've got... You've got uh, Many, many other students that are being homeschooled. And so the, the problems and the competition with, um, with, within our school system are, are, are continuous. But it, it is now, uh, it, it, there's so many different aspects of education on Guam. And that was one of the, the concerns that the individual had was that because of the, the downsizing in, in student enrollment, Mm-hmm. takes away now funding from the school so you know now they're going to be even more challenged with resources and you know right. getting what they need for the school because their enrollment went down and wherever those students went mm-hmm. that's where that's where that funding for that student is going to go and uh, you know that's that's concerning it's very alarming because now what happens to to the school that you know mm-hmm. lost all that enrollment that's uh, right. And, you know, we need to really need to come out and um, work together with the Department of Education. And mm. uh, like you said, we need to find what is going to be that balance between charter schools and Guam Department of Education, because there there has to be a balance, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. uh, because both school, both systems need to to survive and thrive because the bottom line it's the education of our children that's at risk, and we cannot continue to risk their education because right. the the unfairness or um, w- what's going on currently. Mm-hmm. I mean, even the, te- the they were saying they didn't even get their teachers' pay yet. So you know, it's just like wow. Okay, they 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 reprogrammed the funding from from uh, um, in in DOE through the feds, but yet the teachers still haven't gotten their pay. What, what's going on? 
Right. You know, right. I mean, it's very demoralizing. And unfortunately, like you said, that they have their own superintendent, they have their own board of education, that you know, we're only looked at, the administration's only looked at to, you know, where's, where's our funding, where's our needs. And yeah. so and perhaps yet, there's some things that really need to be relooked, revisited, and perhaps laws may, may need to be yeah. changed. Um, another thing, Senator, if you can recall, that they, they brought up was the, the physical condition of our schools. Many of them are quite old, and they say, you know, it, it, it shouldn't be like that. Um, I recall in our time that each um, department or agency, we had a, pro a program uh, where we partnered with the private sector, and it was called Adopt a School. Mm -hmm. So every department adopted one of the, one of the schools. And uh, s during the summer, before the kids would come back, we, w we would be out there water bas blasting, scraping, painting, scrubbing floors, bush cutting, trimming everything back. And whatever supplies were needed, uh, whoever your partner was out of the private sector would contribute. And um, the teachers would come out, administrators would come out and help us. And so uh, it was an in-house type of thing. But it, it really did a lot of volunteerism work. And that community, working alongside even the mayors, to get the schools within their districts um, prepped up. And mm -hmm. those are things that, that we can do to help out. Uh, so adopt a school is, is certainly one thing that, that we can look at. But when, when, we, when they talked about the condition of the schools and the need to perhaps refurbish, we did discuss um, a concept that I had back then when they were building JFK and moved uh, the students out to GW, we, we, we recognized, of course, the strain on faculty, staff, and the students because of the, uh, the double sessions and the tension even among the students. So when we approached um, uh, Cortec at that time and they were up there at uh, Tizen to use the facility as a holding facility, and they re would refurbish the, uh, the buildings and, and make it uh, site adaptable for a school. The intent was to, whatever school needed to be refurbished or rebuilt, that student population would move into that facility. Work would then be done on the existing school. And one of them was, uh, for example, JFK. Mm -hmm. The other one was Antalan Middle School is another example. Um, and uh, once the school is then done or refurbished, you move the students back, next school in line. We need to start thinking about uh, down the line, down the future, what schools need to be uh, refurbished, what needs to be completely torn down and rebuilt, and what are are there any other um, available lands that uh, that we might need to look at, and what's the long term plan for GDOE uh -huh. with their with their uh, master plan on on whatever schools are necessary. So that's just facilities. There's so many other issues there, but we yeah. would need because I know they were they were yeah. GDOE it was turned over to GDOE to build Simon Sanchez mm -hmm. High School, mm -hmm. and uh, you know. GDOE is in the business of educating our children. You know, right. we should, and that's what we should keep them at, and ensure that government supports GDOE by taking care of these building. You know, building these facilities. Yeah. You know, and not put that into the hands of GDOE because, you know, they they really need to concentrate on educating the children. Um, just one other topic that I, uh, um, one other issue on education and as it relates to the charter schools, one of the teachers mentioned that if you look at the charter school model in several states, they're not necessarily funded by the government or by the education system, but rather by private institutions. And so um, who knows what would happen with, say, San Vicente? Would it be a charter school that would be funded by or at least um, something worked out by the, the um, Archdiocese of Agania or a, a um, private institution. Uh -huh. um, we'll see. But I think we need to, we need to, um, there has to be some paradigm shift in how education has, uh, has been handled on Guam and, and even legislatively take a look at the existing laws that created this structure yes. to see is there is there something within the system that can be fixed? Right, and uh, I think that's the approach we would need to take a, a look at everything within the government of yeah. Guam and how it's structured. Yeah, I mean, I can understand the the you know the saying, right? Mm. 
if the wheel ain't broke don't fix it right but if the tire's flat you know you, we need to pump some air into it and you know ensure that it's it's a wheel again yes so you know when we talk about revisiting laws or revisiting uh, uh, structures it doesn't mean that you know we're gonna it's about change right it's mm -hmm. about adapting mm -hmm. it's about da adapting to the future adapting to what we need to ensure that our, our children have that quality education that they need to succeed in life well said well right. said absolutely and in fact um Mr. Booth, are there any questions from uh, the community? Uh, is there a question of the week that we can address, um, whether it relates to education or any, any other topic? Sure, exactly tied to education. This is from Ms. Blancaflor, uh, either from Facebook or Instagram. Uh, the question is, what is the gist of your platform and are there any plans for the education sector? Senator, I, I think we talked a lot we about talked a lot uh, about education and what we education. what we like to do, and right. uh, you know, it's most especially that's important is actually revisiting laws or you know mm -hmm. the structure of how how things came about, yeah. and see what we can do to revisit that. Yeah. But I think uh, working with the superintendent and the board of education is uh, paramount and important as well, because uh, they can't do it without the administration and. and they, they still need the help of, of government of Guam, even though they're an entity of the department, uh, Guam Department of Education. Right. Um, you think about it, too. There, there are many other avenues out there. Uh, when you think of the Guam Trades Academy mm -hmm. and what they've done uh, in skills training, I, all know, I know also that there have been boot camps and um, other, others in the construction industry, as an example. At GCC. At GCC. Um, people there's been a great interest in hvac training and so if you're not necessarily interested in in a pursuing a a college a preparatory curriculum that we would then lead you into a university or a community college uh, one recent uh, charter school that opened is is the career tech that would um, train our, our our students for those that won't would want to pursue careers and so qu quite interesting um there are, uh, I know that there are some other, some other issues there. Um, so w with education, is, are there any other questions that um, we could perhaps answer? Sure, uh, you did touch on already. Um, Sal Cruz posted a, an article on GW's gym remaining closed and mm -hmm. then asking to bring it up. Um, I know you guys already brought it up, but maybe expound on it, on what yeah. can be done in particular for the gym? I think that's where Department of Education now needs to come out and you know, what, what federal funds has been uh, given to Department of Education, especially in the Education Stabilization Fund or anything that was uh, meant to improve or uh, improve the, the, the facilities. If there's immediate funding available for uh, the building of a new gymnasium, mm -hmm. you know, the, there's there's space up there that they can build a new gym yeah you know i mean uh or if that gym can be refurbished mm -hmm. to be uh, you know like new again i mean we see it every day happening yeah. where people go out and they refurbish these houses that are 40 50 years old and then they sell them again right we need to look at our facilities that if we're able to and because facilities that were built in the 70s are way stronger than what is being built today ah you know, yeah. so these are the things that we need to look at. But I think that the gymnasium up at GW is important yeah. because what high school can go through a whole school year without a gym? Mm. It, it's 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 impossible. You know, it's just not it's not conducive for our, our children uh, uh, education, you know, their sports activities, everything that goes on up there. So well, I think that uh, they need to relook and revisit that. I appreciate that. And so now I, I think it's time to wrap, wrap up this show. Um, and Senator, if you, you could just um, expound on the need to register and, and um, all the other issues that we would like uh, the general public to know. Oh, thank you. You know, I, I see our producers really, boy, that clock is something else. It keeps time, keep time you looking is, at it. Uh, I know. <laughs> it's 134, 133, 132. <laughs> Anyway, 
Yes, yeah, sure. So um, we had the Central District mm -hmm. meeting last night mm -hmm. over at uh, Mr. and Mrs. Ray Bloss's residence. Oh, my goodness, what a turnout. And it was wonderful to see, you know, the, the his father, the former, former mayor, mayor Nito Blas, there, yeah. too. And Auntie Doring, his yeah. wife, Doris. Oh, my goodness, just such a lovely family there. It's so uh, so welcoming into their into their home. Yeah. And uh, it was just great. What do they call Mangila? Mangi Town? Mangi Town. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> and, you know, we had, a, we had a great time there. We have on the 21st coming up is our Northern District meeting up in Jigo, uh, Derido, the old flea market area. It would be exciting. Yeah, that would be Can't at five, 5 o'clock p.m. And uh, it's going to be another exciting uh, meeting for the Northern District. Absolutely. And uh, I can't wait to uh, get there on the 21st, 5 p.m. So please, everyone, join us there. Uh, you're going to have fun. You're going to enjoy the food. More, and more importantly, you're going to enjoy the company. Absolutely. Because, you know, we have great people that are there uh, that uh, just want to be there. You know, what I've really enjoyed is, is just taking a minute or two or a few minutes to, as I see a, a person I have not met, I would sit down and, what's your name? And tell me a little bit about yourself and what brought you here. And, uh, oh, just the excitement, you know, of, uh, of meeting new people. And uh, I think you were sharing a story about a certain individual, a woman that uh, had come from, yeah, well, actually, there was two. The the other one was um, uh, first uh, that lady. Uh, you know, she wanted to get our thoughts on uh -huh. you know the hospital and other you know education and things like that. Right. That she just came to the meeting and I said, "Wow, this is great." You know, yeah. she uh, she got wanted to get to know more about us, and that's why she came. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, you secured you you did secure her vote, right? Uh, yes. Thank you very yeah. much, and I appreciate she, that. <laughs> she really appreciated being there, and she appreciated us for yeah. you know um, having having that meeting to you know get to know a little bit more about us. And that's a, that's that's in very encouraging because it, it it shows that people they want to go and they want to know the candidates and what they're all about, and and they'll take the time. And yes, we appreciate that so yeah. much. And there was a Joe, mm -hmm. uh, Joe from Maina. He goes uh, that. He drove all the way to Manila just to be at the meeting wow. because he wanted to know more about Felix and Tony. Hey, hey. Yeah. And, I, <laughs> you know, I told him, right, and I, uh, we, we had a good conversation. But in the end, I told him, I said, Joe, I said, I'm not here to convince you, right? I'm, I'm, not, you know, I'm not talking with you to convince you, mm -hmm. but you're going to feel it in your heart that this is the right team to be with. You know, listening to what we have to say, um, listening to our thoughts and what we want to do for our people and our island, you'll feel it in your heart. And then you're going to say, this is the team I want to be with. And it's going to be because you want to be with us. Right. That's going to make the difference. Yeah. Because that's what makes the difference in, in how people move forward, right? It's because I believe in you. Yeah. I believe in what you do. And I believe that you're going to be looking out for the best interest of the people. Yeah, well said, yeah. well said. Thank you yeah. so much. But that was a good one. It yeah. was it was a very good, awesome meeting, and we're looking forward to the northern me meeting now and, and meeting more new people. Yes, absolutely. All right. So as we uh, wrap up this show, register to vote. We encourage everyone to exercise your right to vote, and you can register to vote at the Guam Election Commission located on the second floor of the Oka Building on Fahrenheit in Tumuning, or online at gecguam.gov. Individuals may opt to register to vote or update their voter registration record when they apply for a driver's license or Guam ID at the Department of Revenue and Taxation's Motor Vehicle Division, or you can visit your village mayor's office. With a deputized voter register, district registration started uh, Friday, August 5th at your village mayor's office. You can ask questions through social media at Camacho at at for Guam. Engage with us on the trail by asking us questions through any of our social media platforms on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. And your questions can be sent to us in text, audio, or video. We look forward to engaging with you in the digital space and answering your questions of the show. All right. And you did mention about the Northern uh, District meeting coming up. So, fantastic. Early voting? Early voting. It's been going on since... Uh, when, when did it start? Well, it closes August 19th, so early voting is happening down at the Westin Hotel from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. on the mezzanine level. Yes. So if you want to early vote, go down to the uh, Westin Hotel and early vote. And don't forget to vote for Camacho Ada. I believe you can either register to vote and then vote. 
Oh, you can register to vote and then vote at the at the Westin. At the Westin. Fantastic. Yeah, definitely. And so I believe when, now you you can also go to your mayor's office, right? Your yes, respective village mayor to to register. To register, yeah. But if you want to register and vote, just go straight down to the Westin. Register to vote, vote, and vote Kamachiwara, and vote stay on the Republican side of the ballot. Yeah, it makes it very convenient. And so, Tony, if we can close out, well. This has been a wonderful episode. We hope that uh, you'll come back and join us again on the trail with Felix and Tony. So, uh, let me just reiterate, join us on the trail with Felix and Tony. All right. So, again, we look forward to seeing you all and uh, talking with you all next week. And have a wonderful week. God bless you all. God bless. Felix and Tony.